second speaker this morning is Rachel Cranton. Rachel is the James B. Duke Professor of Economics at Duke University. And I have to observe, you know, the name of your chair is the name of the founder of the university. That's pretty as honorific as it can get. Uh, after earning a PhD from UC Berkeley in 1993, Rachel joined the faculty at the University of Maryland. She moved to Duke in 2007 and served as Dean of Social Sciences there from 2018 to 2022. So she has decanal experience. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Econometric Society and the Society for the Advancement of Economic Theory. Her website lists 44 scholarly papers. I'm not quite sure the date of that website. So uh, perhaps most significantly, she is co-author with George Akerlof of that book, Identity Economics, in which the preferences of an evolved homo economicus can change with changes in how that individual perceives her current identity. Topic of her talk today is identity, context, and evolution of homo economicus. So, Rachel. Before starting, I want to say what an honor it is to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's an especially um, uh, big honor to be here. Uh, I remember learning microeconomics from your textbook in graduate school and reading your work on corporate culture and your work on intrinsic preferences. So this is really quite something to be here speaking about uh, my work on identity. Um, so the title is Identity, Context, and the Evolution of Homo Economicus. And let's start with thinking about what our economic models look like. So I think we, we build models, right? That's what we do, or uh, a lot of us do as economists. So who populates our models? What do the people look like in our models, right? So the typical person in our model is a stick figure. So we all know what this stick figure is. The stick figure is an individual that has preferences that maximizes utility subject to their budget constraints. So that's the stick figure that populates our model. It doesn't take a lot to realize that's a pretty stark uh, stick figure because humans are social beings, right? We have names, we have families, we have work groups, we're in communities, there are, we, there are religions, there are nations, uh, not to mention the triumvirate of gender, race, and ethnicity, which are all uh, ways in which we describe ourselves and understand ourselves. So, and all of these things which I've just listed for you are all human creations, which are also continually changing and evolving. So human beings have this rich social, we are rich social beings, and yet our models do not describe us this way. So what I'm gonna to talk to you today about is my work on identity and how, with, along with George Akerlof, we've tried to build a model where the people that inhabit our little models are people that have gender, that people have religion, that people have ethnicities, and that those definitions of gender and ethnicity and religion and of nation can also change. So that's where we come into the possibility that what underlies people's motivations can, be, can change over time and can be, in fact, we in fact argue over them all the time. So that's what I'd like to do is first, um, I've just argued for the need to have this evolved social human in our economic models. And one way that I've done that with George Akerlof is this identity framework. The centerpiece of this framework is that individuals think of themselves and others in terms of social categories. And then there are norms which describe the ideal traits and the characteristics of these categories. And there are also norms that have prescriptions for how to behave and interact. So for example, if our categories are male and female, there are norms that describe what the ideal man looks like or the ideal female looks like. There are norms of masculinity and femininity, as well as norms for how women and men, women should, inter, women should behave and how men should behave. And we'll be seeing gender come up later in the talk as well. Sort of the most obvious example. Um, and importantly, I think that once we start recognizing the importance of these social categories and our particular framework, this, this, is, this is our framework, there's probably many other ways to do this, but once we have this framework, this framework allows, or I would even say demands, consideration of the context. And what I mean by context is kind of simple. Who is interacting with whom, where, and when? And if we're not paying attention to the context, 
right? That we're not paying attention to who these people are and how they feel about themselves and how they feel about other people. And we could simply be getting our, our models are just simply misspecified and we could be getting um, the wrong answers and, and predictions that don't match what people are actually doing. So I'll elaborate, of course, on all of this along the way. So what I'm trying to outline of today's discussion, first I'm going to describe how this identity framework captures social context, so how we've gone about it. Then I'm going to summarize research in th three areas where this identity framework has been fruitfully applied, or at least I think it's been fruitfully applied. Then I'm going to argue for the fitness of this and related evolutions of homo economicus. So fitness here used for this evolutionary uh, uh, analogy that we've been saying. Why, is the, why, why, do we, why should we be using this enriched homo economicus in our analyses? Then I'm going to do the, suggest some future research endeavors that, um, where, again, a, a framework that includes these social categories and these norms could be um, fruitfully applied. And then have a final slide on the notion of identity choice and what could we possibly mean by identity choice. All right, so let me uh, launch into the general framework. So the first thing, so what I'm going to do here is give you an outline of how, if you wanted to write down a model that included something like gender or ethnicity or what it means to be an American, how would you go about doing it? Okay, so this is the, the suggestion of how you would build such a model. The first thing you do is you start with a standard model of utility. Okay, so we don't want to throw out the idea that people might care about consumption and income. I'm not saying we should throw those uh, motivations out, but we need to think about that person, that stick figure, and make that stick figure embody, uh, be embodied by um, this social setting. So the first thing you want to do is start with a standard model of utility. This is just notation to help me sort of get us through, these, uh, through this description. Um, so the utility of a person J, uh, a person J might have idiosyncratic preferences. This is what person J likes or doesn't like, and that might be re represented by some sort of function like this. And I do include J's own actions as well as other people other than J. And the importance of of the other people is that when you include other people in someone's utility, that includes the possibility of externalities or strategic interaction. So what I gain from my own action depends also on what other people around me are doing or other people could be um, doing to me. Okay, so that's all just some notation there. Now, to capture the context, we suggest you add what we call the identity ingredients. The first ingredient to add are the social categories. So what are social categories? If you take the list that I had up earlier, it could be gender, it could be ethnicity, it could be the definition of, the nation, of what it means to be American. It's, it's important that it's the categories that are relevant for your problem, for your situation. And you specify the categories and you assign an individual and the individual's assignment of herself and of others around her to those categories. So you tie individuals to categories. The norms, that's the second ingredient, give the ideal and the, or the, what we might think of as the defining attribute of each social category. The norms also give the prescriptions for the appropriate behavior. So let me talk about what I mean by this prescriptions for appropriate behavior for a second. I want to make the distinction between what people like to do and what they don't like to do or what they like to eat or what they don't like to eat and what people should do and what they shouldn't do. So the norms here are about shoulds. What should a woman do? What should a man do? What should an American do? Okay, what should a professor at Stanford GSB do? Okay. Those are prescriptions. They're norms for how people should behave. They're distinct from what people like to do. Okay. So you can like apples and not like oranges. We can also maybe say we should eat apples or we should eat oranges. Well, food starts to maybe seem a little bit silly until you go to, say, for example, people who have religious prescriptions on the foods they eat. right? And so we move from just liking food to what you should and should not eat. 
So I want to make this distinction because typically in economics, we think of our pre of preferences as these likes, what people like and don't like. But we don't often think, well, we're, we're, well I say we don't, we now do. But it's not typical, in our, um, and, and certainly not in our little stick figure, about what people should and shouldn't do. So these shoulds are these imperatives or these prescriptions of what we should and shouldn't do. And all together, these prescriptions as well as these preferences, we might call them tastes, right? So we're going to sort of, sometimes we flip around in our language between all of these things, but I just wanted to make the distinction here between prescriptions, which tell you what you should be doing, and the sort of the standard likes and dislikes, which we sort of typically use in our models. So once we have these identity ingredients, we then have an embellished model of utility, where utility depends on your own and others' actions. And then there's this little I term, which is this self-image or this identity utility. And I'm just going to go to the next slide where we can sort of parse this out. So I've just rip, rip, reproduced up here the two, the two bits. This is the expanded utility function with this I term. And here's this identity term. Okay. So overall utility depends on how the actions affect the standard old economic utility, but also affect how people feel about themselves, affects their own identity. So we use the word identity in a couple of different ways because that's how it's used out there in the world. So I have identity utility. Um, and what does identity utility or this self-image depend on? It depends on acting as you should and acting and other people acting as they should. So the match between your actions and what you're supposed to be doing. So I feel better about myself right, if I act the way I'm supposed to act according to these prescriptions. And I feel better about you when you act the way you're supposed to act, maybe towards me. So it's acting as you should, which is given, and uh, the shoulds are given by the norms, and that should be matching your, uh, where the category assignments, everyone's category assignments. The other uh, bit from this self-image or this identity utility is the fitting in, the extent to which you fit in to the category to which you've been assigned. Okay, so do, to what extent do I feel um, good about myself? I'm a woman, but maybe I don't look like the ideal woman, okay, so I don't feel good about myself. Right. So the extent to which I fit into my category, to the category to which I've been assigned. Um, and then the last, of course, is the status of the category. So all of these categories may have higher or lower status, which makes you feel better or worse about yourself and your position within society. OK, in the base case, so if we, in, we might call that the short run. An individual is going to be choosing their action, right? They're choosing their action here, possibly strategically, because there's other people in the world, to maximize this overall utility, taking as given the category assignments, their own attributes, and the norms. Okay. But that's just the short run. The long run, people can act to change their own category. So you might decide more or less consciously to try and be someone else. Uh, you might change your attributes. You try and look different. You try and dress differently, for example. And you might act to change the norms themselves and the definitions of those categories. And third parties, not Jay, but other people, may have incentives to do that as well. So people have incentives to change the way peop other people think about themselves. The most obvious example is advertising, right? Political parties is another obvious example. So when we take that long one view, we realize that people argue, rally, protest, even die for changes in the categories and the norms, right? And so we can, if we wanted to, we could sort of step away from all of that and be in our ivory towers and not discuss changes in tastes and arguments over tastes, but then we're actually missing what people actually do. Because people argue over norms. Is it appropriate and inappropriate for a woman to act in a particular way or a man to act in a particular way, right? Or a mother to be a particular mother, what does fatherhood mean, etc. So that's what's happening out there. And so we, 
if we are, want to be social scientists that are capturing interactions among people and societal patterns and economic patterns, we need to start thinking about that as well. So I'm just, of course, amplifying David's uh, message in the new book. And in fact, messages that are back, or, or John, uh, that John mentioned, that in, in earlier work as well, that we need to be thinking about where these tastes overall come from, how they evolve, and how they change. OK, so what I'd like to do now, that is the um, identity, the, the overall framework. What I'd like to do is give you a little example of how we can use that, um, just to fix our ideas. And then I will be going through three different areas where identity has been um, used, I think, rather fruitfully. So this example I have is on education. You can think about it as the acquisition of human capital. So what is the standard economic model of the acquisition of human capital? We all know this, right? That individual, it's, it has little bells and whistles on it, but basically an individual has utility, usually we think of as disutility, from effort in school, but that effort in school leads to some marketable skills. The student then goes off and can earn some money. So then the, the, the student then is going to balance the disutility of effort in the school with the benefits of these marketable skills from which they're going to be earning some income. It's a, really, it's a nice model, right? Except when you realize that the decision maker in this is not an adult making these trade-offs between current disutility of effort in school and marketable skills. That the decision maker is actually a child or an adolescent, right? That's the decision maker. So let's think about the context, again, the context in which this decision is being made. It's being made in a school by a child or an adolescent. Okay? So let's model that decision maker's social context. So we're going to add the identity ingredients which are relevant for this decision maker. So that's a key to this method, is you take a look at the people that you're trying to understand what they're doing. You say, what's their context? What does their world look like? So uh, if you'd look at any ethnography of an American high school, so I'm going to model an American high school. Not, and if you were going to go to Brazil, you would, moder a, you would want to look at a Brazilian high school. So an American high school might look something like this. You have these social categories. They might go by different names, but something like there's the leading crowd, there's the nerds, there's the burnouts. Uh, you know, and, and in different parts of the country, these have different names, but there's this general social categories of this type. And accord, associated with these social categories are the norms, and there's norms for uh, the effort, how much are each of these people, people in these different groups, how much effort are they supposed to be exerting in school? What are they supposed to look like? If you're a nerd, what do you look like? Right? If you're in the leading crowd, how are you supposed to you know, wear your hair? Okay, so, and, and maybe you're supposed to have a certain level of wealth which allows you to buy clothes so that you can fit in. Right, so this is the context in which these kids are making decisions about how much to study in school and how much human, human capital to acquire. Um, and so the third bit is that we want to add, once we have the categories and the norms, we then want to build the little model of utility so that we can operationalize it. So what are the costs to effort? If you, if you are not abiding by the norm efforts for your group. So it's pretty easy to do in such a model is that you can have students choose their effort levels in school as well as their groups. So students here are balancing fitting in to their groups with this attaining marketable skills. And it's pretty easy to see that identity concerns can lead to under um, achievement lower academic achievement, because people may want to fit in, there, and if the norm for fitting in involves lower overall effort. And this gets particularly um, interesting when the context starts to involve ethnic groups and curriculum content, which is geared toward or reflects certain histories. So all of the debates we see, over the, see out there about curriculum, we could not understand that unless we start building into our models the social context in which kids are learning, and adults which, who are trying to influence is kids' schooling. So where is Sam? There we go, schooling, right? It's all, you know, so schooling, here I'm not talking about, of course, you know, schooling to make kids good workers, 
but schooling to make kids good citizens. But then, of course, what's the definition of the citizen and what kind of citizen and what history are we teaching them? And this then would affect kids' willingness to exert effort on might perhaps marketable skills, because maybe they need to go out and get a job having mastered a particular curriculum. OK. All right, so I've now described the general identity framework. And what I want to do now is to look at recent research, uh, research over the last 20 years, where this framework has been fruitfully applied. And I'm going to talk about labor supply, social preferences, and political economy. Let's take a, take a look at labor supply and occupational choice. And this is going to be lots about gender. Okay, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of gender issues here. So what would a standard economics model look like? A standard economics model has something like an individual is trading off labor and uh, where they earn wages with leisure. And this model can have things in it for preferences for jobs, maybe individual talents, the effort required. And you can get something like, well, you've got to pay people a lot to do a job they don't really like. So some sort of compensating variation. But now let's add some identity ingredients. And again, what's going on in the workplace? Well, there's gender, and there's, I'm going to do two, gender and caste. So some examples from India. So there are social categories that are operative in the labor market and in people's choices over what jobs to uh, train for. I'm going to talk about gender or caste. And marriage, I add marriage because another um, element here is labor supply, how much money uh, when I decide to go into labor market, how much money do I want to earn? What kind of jobs am I looking for? And what are the, how much am I going to earn? Perhaps relative to my spouse. Okay. The norms would be the gender appropriate or caste appropriate jobs and relative earnings within the household. Okay. And the utility would be the gains or losses, again, from abiding by these norms or the externalities from acting or not according to the norms. So you build these models, and you get certain predictions about people's labor supply, what types of jobs they might want to do, how many hours they're going to want to work, how much money they're going to want to earn. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So let's take a look at gender in the United States. So this is a paper, um, uh, Gender Identity and Relative Income uh, Within Households. And this is looking at the US gender norm that women should not earn more than their husbands. So that's, again, I put it in the shoulds. So women shouldn't earn more than their husbands. And this uh, research team took a, look, so that, took a look out there in the data. And what do you see? Indeed, that if you look at the United States data and you look at the distribution of relative income, uh, there is a disc in, within a household, there's a discontinuity at a half. So we've got the share of the household income earned by the wife. And we see a discontinuity at a half in 1970. 1980, 1990, into 2000, okay, from the census data. So it's showing that these norms are operative in the, relative, in the um, share of distribution of relative income within the household. Let's so look at another norm paper. You might know this. It's in a business school context. I probably know a lot of, of quite a few of the papers that I'm going to be presenting here. So this is this paper, Acting Wife. Um, the norm here is a similar norm, that women should not earn more than their, their spouse, as well as a norm that women should not be performing better than men, generally. And this is in a business school context, where uh, the researchers uh, looked at women's stated, uh, st stated aspirations for jobs, as well as their performance in classes. And the results are that unmarried women in this MBA program underperformed in publicly observed graded tasks, so in participation. So the, the participation of women was lower than it would have been if the women were unmarried. And unmarried women profess less desire for salary and for jobs with travel in real stakes questionnaires. This was the questionnaire from the business school itself when the answers were expected to be seen by unmarried male peers. Okay? So that's, you want to see this here. These are single women. This is their salary that they'd like to earn. right? And this is the private treatment versus the public treatment. So when women anticipated that their answers to this survey were going to be seen, unmarried women, when their answers were by unmarried male peers, that they lowered their 
salary aspirations. So you might say, so this is, um, this is evidence that the labor supply, whoops, the labor supply decision um, and the occupational choice, because they're talking about jobs which don't involve travel, are influenced by these gender norms or match the gender norms. Let me give you another example. Oh, actually, sorry, I thought I had another, uh, what, uh, I switched, now I know which one's coming next. The ones I've been talking about up until now have been about women underperforming, right? And women uh, earning less than their husbands. The next set I want to talk about are masculinity norms. So this is a really uh, wonderful paper that looks at Australia. And take Australia and look at regions where historically uh, the sex ratio was very high, a lot more men than women. And look at those regions today. Okay, so this historical sex ratio, and you look at regions today, and you look at the masculinity norms, and we see in these regions more violence, higher rates of male suicide, greater occupational segregation where the men are less likely to take on jobs that are not traditionally male jobs. So these are masculinity norms which men are following. Okay? Another masculinity norm uh, this is in caste and gender together in India, where women but not men will undertake caste nonspecific jobs. So it's the women in India that are getting the training in English and going to work in call centers, whereas the men are doing more caste specific jobs. Uh, a last one, another beautiful paper that just came out. Um, this is uh, directly asked the question, uh, would, would somebody give up wages, a significant amount of money, in order to not do a job that was aversive to them? Meaning aversive, it doesn't match their caste identity. Okay? And the answer is yes. You give up quite a lot of money, up to a month's wages, to not undertake an, a non-identity ta caste task, even when it's done privately. So nobody's going to see the person to do the job. Right? But they're asked, people, are, uh, given a, uh, people have a job, and then they're asked, look, do you want to go do this other job for 20 minutes? And no one's going to see you. Right? This other job could have a caste relation to it. It could be like a typical job for a caste, or it could be not related. Here's when they're not, whoops, here's when they, this is, these are the results for when the jobs are not related, and here are when the jobs are related to identity. And we see that the take-up rate is much lower, right? And this is for 60 minutes of work, right, for example. And you're earning about a month's wages. So people will forego about a month's wages not to spend 20 to 30 minutes doing a task which is aversive. And aversive in the sense that the cast, the, the cast um, interpretation, this is a job that is not for someone like you. It is not your cast. OK, so let me. Um, let me turn to my second example. Let me go back. Oh, sorry. Sorry. My second example of a research area. So the second example of a research area is the area of social preferences. So first I should say that in this social preference literature, we're already dealing with a somewhat evolved uh, homo economicus. Okay? So we're now working, we're looking at people who actually do care about other people, and they care about their own income, perhaps their own income relative to somebody else's income. So that's the world of social preferences. So the social preferences here refers, it's a, it's a, it's a precise term, and the precise term is the extent to which somebody cares about somebody else's income, perhaps in relation to their own. So that's the, what the social preferences words mean here. Okay? And the, the, um, sort of robust finding, um, uh, okay, yes, sorry, that's right up here. The robust finding in this literature is that people exhibit something called inequality aversion. Inequality aversion, I somehow, I feel uncomfortable in a situation where I'm making much more money than somebody else, right? So you see this in, um, you know, experiment after experiment after experiment. And people talk about that in terms of wages, too, in, in companies. People don't want to be making, uh, feel sort of perhaps uncomfortable if they're making a lot more than somebody else in an organization. We'll see. 
Anyway, let's add to this, though, context, okay? Who are these people who are caring about somebody else's income? What context do they live in? How do they think of themselves, and how do they think of other people? So we're going to add a very simple social context now. This is a context where we have different social groups, and we're just going to call them in-group and out-group. So for your psychologists in the room, and also the folks that have read this literature, we're borrowing here from social psychology that you might have groups, and we can think about groups as being in-groups and out-groups. Okay? Um, there are norms which um, give appropriate reallocations of income that are contingent on the groups. So the utility, you can now build a utility function here. The utility function where an individual cares about their own income. They care about the other person's income. They perhaps care about their other person's income relative to their own income, but all contingent on the group. Okay? And that group could be, we're going to do in-group and out-group. In the world out there, that could be different ethnicities, for example. And I'm going to give you an example of different ethnicities in a bit. So now the social preferences have these categories attached to them. So it's social preferences that are um, contingent on whether you're in my group or you're out of my group. So uh, a first paper that used this method to see the um, implications for group identity and social preferences, the paper by Chen and Lee, what they did is borrowed uh, the exact uh, methods from social psychology. You bring subjects into the room. You divide the subjects into two groups according to their preferences on paintings, the classic Clay and Kandinsky um, paintings. And the task is to allocate income to yourself and to your counterpart. And you're, you're presented with these matrices, which is sort of standard method in the social preferences literature. You allocate money to yourself, right, or to somebody, uh, uh, and to, you, make, you make a choice of a, of a row in a matrix. And that row is giving you money and giving somebody in your own group money. And here you're presented with the same matrix, right, but now that the person to whom you're making this decision about their income is in the other group. So the, the subjects have been divided into two groups, own group and other group, and they're presented with these series of choices where they choose income allocations, right? Where they're choosing money for self and other, where that other person is either in their own group or the other group. So a standard method. So this is the, exactly the way people elicited, stated, elicited sorry, social preferences, but what Chen and Lee did, whoops, what Chen and Lee did was introduce the group divisions in the very beginning. And the finding, get all my buttons right here, the finding is on average, subjects are less inequality averse towards counterparts in the other group. So people are generally inequality averse, except they don't care, they're, they're not as disturbed by it as much when the subject is in the other group from them. Okay, so subjects are on average inequality averse, but less so when the subject is in the other group. I think I'm okay. Yes? So does that mean that if, uh, if you're in an organization and the boss is deciding how to give out bonuses, you want to be in the same group or identify with that boss? Um, I'm, I think so, but I'm that's, that's not sure that's a clarifying question. That's an extrapolating from what we currently have here. So generally, I do have some other work where you might want to start thinking about yourself as more like somebody when you are not um, competing with them. So I have some work we could talk about at the end that I think is going in the direction that you're saying. So imagine you're in a work environment. We're going away from this particular study, study which isn't quite published yet. But the idea is that you, you want to, you, you, how close you feel to somebody is going to depend on whether you're competing with them or not over wages, possibly. All right, so that's the result, which I thought was really a quite striking result. But there was something about the result which I found, uh, I wouldn't call it disturbing, but something I wanted to investigate more, is that it was kind of nice that people were inequality averse towards somebody in, who wasn't in their group. But that actually doesn't match a lot of human history. And a lot of human history, you're not inequality averse for somebody who's outside of your group. We atta people attack people who are outside of their group. So the, I did this experiment um, with some colleagues at Duke 
where we wanted to deconstruct this average bias in social preferences. And there we used, um, a within group design, people were uh, divided into groups according to Clay and Kandinsky paintings according to, and according to political party and did the same sort of task. And the objective is to study individual treat, individuals across treatments to unpack this average bias and inequality aversion. And what do we see? I'll go through this kind of quickly, but what we're doing here is we're, we're looking at favoritism that's exhibited in the, in the minimal group, which is the paintings, versus favoritism towards your in-group person when you're in the political group, and we're seeing, do they match? And what's quite remarkable is that there's actually a large group of people who don't care about groups at all. So there are some people out there which in our little model here, all they care about is money for themselves. So those people do exist here. There's also quite a lot of people for whom the group, the political group, matters quite a lot. And then there's another group of people that doesn't matter what group you put them in, they're going to act in a very um, in unequal way towards the person outside of the group. So 20% of subjects are what we call dominant seeking towards the out group. They will actually pay to reduce the income of the other subject if the other subject is not in their group. So these are people who are seriously not inequality averse, right? They actually are showing a preference for inequality. Okay. Let me move to um, okay. Let me um, uh, let me move to uh, this last um, study in this category. Um, this is looking at a joy of destruction game where that's exactly the choice. You can pay to reduce somebody's income. So it doesn't allow for all of the other social preferences of those matrices I just described. It's a very a stark joy of destruction game. And here they looked at sequential decisions and they showed that there's a higher rate of destructive behavior following previous choices. So the person before you, if they chose a destructive task, a destructive uh, against the, the, your counterpart, you, if you're coming second or third, are more likely to follow in that destructive, uh, you know, to, to do the same destructive action, but for people who are in the um, other group, not for people who are in your group. So there's a contagion of this destruction, uh, this destructive um, choices, when you're f the, the people who are making decisions are facing people in the other group. All right, the third area I'd like to discuss is political economy. Uh, what would a standard model do? You have individuals who have preferences for policies. You, sometimes we think about these as economic policies, such as redistribution. The, uh, the individuals vote for candidates whose platform is closest to their preferred economic policy. Okay, so let's take a look at voters out there. Do we think voters are doing this? No, we don't think voters are doing this. Right, so what are, what's the context in which voters are making their choices? Um, we can add social categories like class, ethnicity, nationalism, the ideals of the category, who belongs as part of the nation, who fits within a, uh, who fits within a class and the norms for those policies, and the voters that may gain or loss, lose from being in a particular group and abiding by the norms for that group and then the policies that are aimed for that group. So obviously this is, one could talk about identity politics here. Um, there's a model, a uh, very nice um, application of the identity framework to this. It's a model of social identity with an application to the political nation. And what Moses is trying to do in this paper is trying to understand this pattern. So down here in the right, uh, this is the fraction of the population that says they're very proud to be whatever, Australian, Turkish, American, and so on. And this is the social welfare spending. And of course, you see this relationship that people, that in countries where the population says they're very proud to be whatever, there's less social welfare spending, okay? And um, an identity model can help us understand that pattern. In a standard model, poor would vote for more redistribution. But in an identity model, we can add the nation or class as the social categories. And there's utility from belonging to either the nation or the class. And then in that model, you can have a social identity equilibrium where the poor identify more with the nation. They don't vote for redistribution. And instead, they're getting their status from being part of the national group. So that's an example of identity applied to political economy. There's a similar model uh, on trade policy, which I'm going to not go into for sake of time. 
Okay, now I want to get to what I'm thinking might be the heart of the, my talk here, or our discussion, is I want to argue for the fitness of this model of identity and for other evolutions of homo economicus. And why it might be the heart of what I'm talking, uh, what I'm doing here today is because we often don't go through this exercise. When we write down papers, we have our model, we have our, we have our introduction about the problem, and then we go ahead and we you know, solve our model and we look at the data. But we don't actually ask, is this the right thing? Are we doing the right thing here? Is this the right way to be going about it? So I'm gonna argue for the fitness of this evolved homo economicus. The one I have here, the one Sam's has been talking about, and so on. And what criteria should I use to argue that these, that these, uh, you know, if these are little, these people who are populating their model are actually more fit? Well, I'm going to use two criteria which we often use when we evaluate models. The first one is prediction. One thing that economists typically say is important about a model is that a model should generate predictions that are consistent with the evidence. So do these models with these evolved homo, economics, homo economicus uh, ca you know, creature uh, populating the model, do they do that? And I think I've just shown you at least seven studies where it does. The models with identity or this new homo economics generate new and better predictions. Now, some of you are probably saying, oh, yeah, right, you just throw stuff in the utility function, too many degrees of freedom, you can explain anything. You've probably heard some of that critique, right? I actually don't find that critique particularly insightful. That's just mathematics. You add more degrees of freedom, you can explain more stuff. But it's not particularly meaningful, right? And the answer is that, no, you actually are really constrained when you write down these models. You're constrained by what's going on out there. You're constrained by the evidence. We are bound by the evidence when we write down these models. I'm not making it up that this is a gender norm. This is what people say. This is what people discuss. This is what we observe. Which gets me to my next point. Another thing that we talk about, that we value in our economic analysis, is parsimony. We like to have models that are simple, that explain things well and elegantly, right? These are the type of words we use, right? Okay, I'm going to make the argument that models with identity or this new homo economicus are often the simplest and most straightforward models we could write down. They pinpoint exactly what is going on. And so identity norms morality, ethics are parsimonious explanations of choices and behavior. And it's actually quite strikingly straightforward to see this. So I want to give you an example from a Supreme Court decision. This is Price Waterhouse uh, versus Hopkins. Hopkins was suing Price Waterhouse because she wasn't promoted for partner. This is a 1989 um, case. And the, the finding of the case is that discrimination against an employee on the basis of sex stereotyping, that is a person's nonconformity to social or other expectation of that person's gender, constitutes impermissible sex discrimination in violation of Title VII. So that's the finding. Let's look at the majority opinion. Okay? Indeed, we are tempted to say that Dr. Fisk, that's the Dr. Fisk, that's Susan Fisk, uh, that Dr. Fisk's expert testimony, when she was an associate professor, was merely icing on Hopkins' case. It takes no special training to discern sex stereotyping in a description of an aggressive female employee as requiring a course at charm school, nor turning to Thomas Byers' memorable advice to Hopkins does it require expertise in psychology to know that if an employee's flawed interpersonal skills can be corrected by a soft-hued suit or a new shade of lipstick, perhaps it is the employee's sex and not her interpersonal skills that has drawn the criticism. It's there, right? We don't have to look far. A parsimonious model is going to have, a gender, going to have gender norms in it. The last criteria that I'd like to use is not a traditional one, but I'd like to bring it up, is policy. If we want to use our models to understand and perhaps make recommendations about policy, then we need this expanded uh, homo economicus, because much policy concerned with behavior and interactions that are not captured in models with our stick figure. And a really simple example is something like social media policies and all of the exchanges of messages that people are doing online. Our stick figure would do nothing like that. We need a socially minded homo economicus to even begin to understand those interactions. And 
another point on policy is that identity compels attention to the context. And so it will give us an understanding whether a policy which we design in Houston will work in San Francisco or not. And even when I say that, you think, oh, maybe it wouldn't, right? So once we, the, these frameworks is incredibly important for understanding the transport portability of policy. Okay, I, I'm going to have just a few minutes where I'm going to suggest some future research endeavors. I've got a few minutes that I think I'll be able to fit that in. One is the economics of organizations. And here I feel, you know, here I am at Stanford GSB talking about the economics of organizations. What's the central problem? is to mitigate goal misalignment between owners and management and management and workers and so on. And there's been a lot of work on incentive pay schemes, bonuses that could possibly lead to distortive efforts. And of course, David pointed us in this direction a long time ago that we need to be going deeper, right? We shouldn't only be looking at pay schemes and bonuses. That norms and intrinsic incentives and role consistency can have a lot to do with how people behave in organizations. And to give a sense of how identity or an evolved homo economicus could help with these issues, let's just take a trip from some, some place that's pretty far away from here, and I encourage you to take a look at the website. Let's go to Wedd's Point, where 17 to 18 year old men and women are trained to become officers in the US Army. And let's look what their drop off day looks like. Okay? They're dropped off, right? And it's called reception day. And the new cadets arrive they look like the students that show up at Stanford and at Duke until their hair is cut off and they dye in uniforms, and then they look like this. Okay? So what's going on? Why is this happening? Why the dramatic haircut, the speeches, the red sash? There's all details to this ritual. Well, let's see what the Army says it's doing. What does the Army think it's doing? Well, the Army says it's trying to change recruits' view of themselves, to transfer them from civilians to military cadets. So there's a transformation, an identity transformation of these kids that arrive at West Point. And you do it here too, it just doesn't look the same, right? We all do this, right? All right, so all of this says that these rights and programs point to new directions for organizational economics, which are beyond the theories of incentives based on wages and bonuses. So I'll give you a sense. How people feel about themselves the organization, their part in the organization, all may be critical to work incentives. And of course, there is some work which is uh, moving in this direction. So there's three papers which I could point to. One I have on the economics of organization, and another on competition and incentives with motivated agents where workers have preferences for the mission of or or the organization. But in my last minute or two, what I'd like to show you is some empirical work. So there's now empirical work on trying to understand and trying to um, see p uh, workers and, their, and, and, and to the extent to which they feel more or less part of organizations, does that have ins implications for their work incentives? Gorgeous paper that's just out um, on the ideology, ideology and performance in public organizations. I should say a lot of this work is in public sector organizations. And what does this paper do? It looks at U.S. federal procurement officers. So these are civil servants, the U.S. civil servants, right? And it looks at their job performance when the president of the United States is of the same or not political party. And we see there's lower performance of these civil servants when the president is of the opposite party. So this is pointing to an importance of ideological consistency, right? This is what they did is they, these are, this is actually, I think, combining three different presidential transitions. And you can see that post-transition, if the president is of the opposite party, you see that there are um, higher cost overruns of these procurement officers. Okay. Um, last um, area that I'd like to discuss as a future research um, area is inequality. We know that inequality is increasing and is increasingly a topic of study. Many or most studies have a sort of a macro view or a micro macro view. And I'm going to argue that an evolved homo economics is needed for the micro foundations of inequality for the simple reason is that much inequality is associated with social difference. Inequality isn't somehow randomly distributed in our society. It has patterns, and those patterns reflect these categories which we've been talking about. 
here's my list. We can pick a place and we can see that certain people from certain social groups have less than others. So that if we don't bring in a model that has the social context, we won't be able to understand this inequality. And I can give you some examples really quickly that we've disc already discussed. Education, right? If we bring in identity into models of education, we can start understanding some reasons, some patterns of inequality. The labor supply and occupational choice, so we have gender and the marriage norms that we discussed. We also have the masculinity norms, which we discussed, all leading to different patterns of inequality. The social preferences that we uncovered tell us that people prefer in unequal situations. So if we're going to battle inequality, we have to think about why is it that people have these preferences for inequality. And of course, we have the political economy uh, results, which I also talked about earlier, that national identities can help perpetuate inequalities. So these would be some suggestions for future research endeavors which employ a social, uh, a social framework right, that can help us understand um, these problems which confront us every day. So I'd stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>